Agile for Humans is brought to you by Audible.com. Get one free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash agile. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player, including Scrum, The Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time by Jeff Sutherland, and Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson. Visit www.audibletrial.com forward slash agile to enjoy your free audiobook today. Processes and tools dominate today's agile discussions. But we are devoted to the individuals and interactions that make it work. From the beginner to the veteran practitioner, we have something for you. Welcome to Agile for Humans. All right, we are back. It is the first episode of 2016, so Happy New Year to everyone out there. This is another episode of Agile for Humans. I'm your host, Ryan Ripley. Joining me tonight... A uh, good friend of the stream, Tim Ottinger, made an introduction, uh, reached out and said, Ryan, I want you to meet Bill Caputo. He's a smart guy. He's a wonderful agilist, and he has this crazy idea that I think would be a great fit on your podcast. So I reached out to Bill, and uh, he graciously agreed to join us. So, Bill, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Ryan. It's really great to be here. And uh, what Bill has done, he has set up 12thprinciple.org, and I'll let Bill give the intro to it and talk about... Uh, what exactly it is, but he's essentially embraced one of the Agile principles from the manifesto, and he's, uh, well, I'll let Bill, Bill, go ahead and dive in. What led you to this? What are you doing here? And, uh, you know, if you could just give the overview, overview that would be great. Sure. Uh, you know, like you said, uh, Tim and I have known each other a long time, uh, probably going on 15 years now. Uh, we were, uh, we were all, uh, working together to try to understand this thing called lightweight methodologies back in the day. And then uh, suddenly there was the Agile Manifesto and everyone was buzzing about that. And, you know, really the 12th principle is not much more than an extension of what we, we've all been trying to do for the last you know, 15, 16 years, which is get at what makes for successful software delivery and try to do a little bit better every time we go out to do it again. Uh, but, uh, but the site itself sort of uh, grew out of, uh, <laughs> actually it grew out of an online conversation between Michael Feathers and Mike Hill, two more object mentor alums like uh, Tim Moniger. They were debating whether or not uh, scaling agile was uh, just code for command and control. Um, Debating is probably the wrong word. I think uh, they were sort of asserting that it was and whether or not that was okay. And uh, I found myself saying, I'm with you, fellas. <laughs> it's scaling and it's okay. Uh, I mean, it's command and control and maybe it's okay. And that led me to say, is there really anything in the Agile Manifesto that is a, is anti-command and control or, or says really anything about the organizational structure of, of the wider organization around a, a delivery uh, effort. And so I popped open the Agile Manifesto and gave it a quick reread. I hadn't done that in a few years. And uh, what, what, what jumped out at me was that, no, there really isn't. It's, it's very centered on individual, individual project efforts. Uh, most of the subjects, if you look at each individual value in the 12 principles, all but one of them, uh, the the you, the subject of the of the advice goes toward individuals or uh, or, or project level concerns, except one. Uh, so that twelfth principle, if you will, uh, was the one that uh, we you know pulled out and made into the site after you know some conversations with some other people around me that are interested in such things and. Uh, the rest of it just sort of came out of trying to clarify this idea that if there's nothing inherent in the manifesto uh, that that says anything about organization, where did that come from? Why why is that so ingrained in the agile culture? The idea that agile will bring this 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 egalitarian, collaborative, everyone works together and trusts one another. Where does it come from? And uh, what I think is uh, well. I mean, I'm not sure what I think. That's why I built the site. I wanted to get out there and start to have conversations with people. Uh, I have some ideas, but um, no concrete beliefs on what the, that is. 
So the what we're calling the twelfth principle, just for um, for the listeners out there, it's really the build projects around motivated individuals, give them the environment and support they need, and trust them to get the job done. And I and I think you're you're absolutely right. There is a it's almost like a, a leap of faith, right? We're going to do this agile adventure, and there's going to be organizational nirvana, and things are just going to come together. But wait a minute, how do you actually get there? And so I think it's a very interesting conversation that you've sparked by really embracing this principle and saying, this is the end goal. Now work backwards almost in a way, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think, I think there's some, some of that here. Uh, I think, uh, like any, any good evangelical statement, uh, or flag in the ground, if you will, you know, it gives people, people put into it, I think a little bit of themselves and uh, the, the manifesto has that element to it as well. Um, it was great watching the commentary when the site went live and, you know, it sort of took off there. We got something, something like 600 people signed it in the first 48 hours. And, uh, I think it's, I think the total is somewhere around 800 now have signed it. Uh, but it's uh, a very yeah interesting way that you went about collecting signatures too. Mm-hmm. I, it's the first time I've seen Twitter used as the signing mechanism, and I think that really helped uh, spark the discussion, spread the popularity. So uh, wherever that idea came from, very good one. Um, uh, I give at least half of the credit, if not all of it, goes to Ben Rady. Uh, we I work with Ben. He and I have known each other for a long time, and uh, we were just. I raised to him the point that I did not want to do a signing similar to the manifesto, where people put their email address in, mainly because I didn't want to build the infrastructure and set up a mail server and have to read <laughs> through them. <laughs> laziness right. is the you know the, uh, what's uh, Larry Wall's uh, principles, right? Uh, laziness is a virtue of a programmer. But yeah, I think uh, it said yeah. uh, programmers needed hubris, laziness, and uh, what was the other one? I think it's impatience. Impatience, right. <laughs> so I've got but all it is of this. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I think most of us do. But um, it is an interesting concept. I'm curious some of the, the responses you've gotten. You know, what's, the, what's the feedback look like? What are the questions that are coming out of it? How has the conversation moved uh, forward since you've launched this site and really have sparked a conversation around uh, this very important principle? You know... There are some definite themes in the commentary online, um, and at this point, I'm still kind of letting it ferment. There, uh, uh, and also, I have a whole bunch of things going on, so we're about two weeks out, and I haven't put up any official response to those comments, but I've got them all cataloged, and at some point, I'm going to organize them. But some some definite themes popped out. Uh, there was the theme of, oh, here we go, another religion. This is the uh, Protestant Reformation for Agile. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Which was doubly funny because I think we were kind of joking along those lines when we first started talking about it. Um, yeah, because it is when you make a statement like this, when you when it's specifically when you take something out of context and you try to generalize, uh, such as the the values and the principles in the manifesto, it's easy for people to just that that resonates with me. This is this is me, man. These people are like me. Um, and I think that's healthy and even necessary to get an idea to spread. Uh, but at the same time, the criticisms uh, that were flying around was, you know, one people going to learn that you can't just build, you know, you can't just boil software delivery down to sound bites. Uh, well, I actually happen to agree with that. You can't, um, but you can't get a conversation started either with, you know, a doctoral dissertation. You got to start somewhere. And um, and I think getting at what goes on in organizations. Agile has a lot of traction in a lot of organizations and come, has come under a lot of criticism for turning into its opposite over the last decade. And the question that I find most interesting is why? Why does that happen? And what can we do about it? So that was the theme. And I saw a lot of people saying, yes, this is what is is essential, is this trust. And um, some people saw motivated individuals as the thing they cared about. Uh, those were a couple of the themes. There were more, but uh, I figure I'll give you a chance to uh, uh, take this in a different direction if you want. But. No, I think part of the issue, and and I think you've hit on this somewhat as well, is that people aren't thinking about the principles. You know, it becomes yeah. very simple to take them at face value, to take them at um, a very literal interpretation, and run with them, thinking that you've you've hit the, on the right path. But what you've done here is taken this particular principle, and now people really have to think about, so 
if we're going to embrace building projects around motivated individuals, there's a voluntaristic aspect to that. So we can't force people to be on agile teams. And then what does that mean to your organization and taking that conversation into your leadership team and really breaking that down and looking at give them the environment and support they need. Well, now you have to talk to developers and business people and find out why aren't you successful? Why are you successful? What is the environment that would be, you know, the best way for you to succeed? And then finally, trust. You know, is trust in your organization? What does that look like? Can we talk about trust? Is it safe to say there's no trust? You know, all these things pop up simply because you're willing to have the conversation as opposed to, you know, giving this principal a quick read and then not asking any of the the thousands of questions behind the initial statement. Yes, I think that is the case. And, you know, and the values have always gotten more traction than the principal's anyway right because they're on the front page and they're they're very pithy and you know we we you know the structure has been copied many many times this on the left over this on the right and uh you know and parodied and everything else over the last 15 years and uh well not quite i guess we're not quite 15 years of agile yet uh <laughs> we're not that old yet not that old uh, uh, although i was on the xp mailing list i think around 99 so for me this feels like a long time and uh and and yet I still see I see a lot of differences in that time, but one thing that hasn't changed is is uh, is is this idea that if you have uh, I think it's in the 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 text on, on the on the twelfth principle.org site, it's not essential to have any particular organizational structure. I've seen six not only have I seen agile successfully practice whatever that might mean in multiple different types of contexts, but I've seen success that doesn't really qualify as agile in contexts that are very different. I don't think the structure of the wide organization is 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 either necessary or defined by agile. I, but what is essential is that the organization around it, the culture, the, the environment that of the delivery effort uh, needs to not be toxic to that effort. To what the to if you look at the other values and principles of agile, they you can create an environment that is toxic to that, to toxic to collaboration. Uh, for example, if you do something like forced ranking has become popular in many different organizations, the CEO or whatever his name was over there at uh, GE, I guess it was, at the time, and that book was aimed at how do you weed out upper middle management that are competing with one another for the C-level positions in a big corporate environment. Well, forced ranking might make sense there because those people all have careers if they don't make it to the, to the suite. But uh, when you start applying that to programmers and saying, okay, everyone, I've seen this before, when you everyone on this team is going to be forced ranked and your bonuses are going to be allocated accordingly. Well, there goes collaboration right out the window because no matter what you do, uh, everyone's going to be looking at everyone else and saying, my gain is your loss. Um, and in fact, in that environment where I saw it, uh, what what we did for a while was we just said, we're just going to divide by N, where N was the number of people, whatever bonus pool was given. Um, and believe it or not, the wider organization eventually told us to stop doing that. <laughs> like, you know, to, to that, that's an example of toxic to some of the values of the environment, right? If you're trying to foster collaboration and trust, but you won't let people um, help each other uh, without costing themselves something, that's, that's toxic. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's Jack Welsh, who uh, Thank was you. the yes, G- Jack Welsh. CEO who uh, initially came up with that. And then a lot of um, HR professionals took it to the, the most extreme level. But uh, what's encouraging now is that I think Harvard Business Re- Business Review recently ran an article uh, where around 10% of the Fortune 500 has dropped that practice. <laughs> They've seen that or the pay for performance uh, practice does not work and that a force ranking type system is demotivational. So it took a number of years to get the big brains to, uh, to come to that conclusion. But I believe 10% of the Fortune 500 has dropped the practice it seems to be swinging the other way, which is a very good sign. But you're right. You know, if you and I are on a team and you need help and I'm ahead on my work, what's my incentive to help you? Why wouldn't I want to trip you instead? And it's it's one of those things. You know, I look at the 12th principle and I think, you know, give them the environment. And I really think uh, in some ways you could look at that and think, give them the system. 
you know, give them the systems of work and the support within those systems to get the job done. And I think that's an important way to look at it because every system around the people contribute to create the environment. You know, it's not just a pool of programmers, a PM, a manager, and a business person. There's also HR, legal, finance, and all the processes and overhead and ceremony and baggage that they bring in that can also totally pollute the pool uh, that everyone's working in. Uh, yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And another theme of some things that I've been interested in a lot lately is, uh, I, I don't know if you've noticed, but I've been throwing rocks at metaphor lately and our use of metaphor in the delivery world. And uh, believe it or not, I see these two things as related. Uh, and it hinges right on that word environment. Because if we want to describe, uh, the, the co in the most general terms, technology delivery and what, what is successful and what, if we want any way of comparing and different efforts. Um, I think our reliance on metaphors like productivity metaphor, manufacturing metaphors, uh, where productivity comes from, um, hinders us in doing that. And if instead, I think um, the uh, you know, modeling what we do as a system would make a lot more sense. We have much richer analytical tools if we borrow from systems theory and, and, uh, and those kinds of uh, well, pretty well-established uh, disciplines and when you start talking about systems you have the system and you have its environment and when you do that you start to see oh all the people interacting individuals and interactions over processes and tools well what i hear there individuals and interactions is really just another way of saying social system and um that that ties very nicely to the environment in the 12th principle so, yeah, I think you have to look at the wider environment. I think you have to look at the wider organization. How is HR helping you to recruit people and in, uh, motivated individuals? I mean, if you're not tied into that properly, you're not going to get anywhere either. There is this drive to always compare the work to something else, though, and that drives us to that metaphor kind of paradigm. It's easier to talk about the work than it is the system. And so then you get into the situations where we're talking about uh, the work as building a house or comparing it back to manufacturing. And then we get stuck in those discussions about, you know, optimization and productivity, which are really boring conversations in the context mm -hmm. of software development, at least in my opinion. I know that you have a recent post about uh, productivity and how mm -hmm. it's time to retire that metaphor. I'm wondering if you could dig into a little bit of that and how it relates over to this 12th principle thinking. <sighs> Uh, okay, sure. The, um, the, the, the connection is, is a little bit distant. There, there may be different sides of a pyramid that ultimately leads toward, uh, my, uh, my thinking on theory in general. But, um, if you think of metaphor and our use of metaphor, I, it is, it's been a thing of mine for quite a while now, maybe a year, year and a half, um, I've really gotten it in my head. I wanted to dig into how we talk about what we do. I think I mentioned this to you in an email. Uh, uh, Ten years ago, when I left consulting, I thought I really understood how to do all this, and I thought I and and I went off to do it. And what I found out was I didn't know what I was talking about. Um, but nobody <laughs> else does either, right? And uh, but but the catch is, I think I I think I I think we have a good understanding of how to do this. I think we are really bad at talking about it. Like we don't have good language. If you, if you look at even computer science, let alone technology deliver you know, technology delivery as the social, as the application of computer science uh, does not have good language to talk about what we do. We have great, we can talk about computing, computability. We can talk about decision theory. We have good language there. Um, but compare the, the, the social element of what we do, the, the, the non-computable part of what we do, to the rest of the sciences, and we, we, look, we look terrible. We have no good language. We rely on all these half-baked metaphors or ones that we inherited from the business world, like manufacturing. And, and we keep trying to twist them and, and apply them and get very pedantic about their definitions. And, and we it, collectively, as a group, we... we we seem to think that if we can just nail down those definitions of what is productivity, we will have this licked. And I don't believe that. I, I just think what the metaphor is a bad one, and it should be retired because it's not coherent enough. It's not deep enough to give us 
uh, the kind of analogical reasoning that we need to talk amongst ourselves. We don't have the depth of knowledge of manufacturing, and we're not necessarily dealing with manufacturing experts anyway, to use it to map technology delivery to their comfort zone. And so I think clarifying our use of metaphor is an important first step in getting a better uh, ability to intersubjectively, you know, amongst ourselves, share knowledge and not just ideas and catchphrases on what we do. And part of the difficulty, I think, around that is even a simple manifesto, right? So we've got four values, 12 principles, and how badly twisted has that become? <laughs> and now we... And now we're we're trying to talk about more complex manufacturing theory and apply it back to uh, software engineering development and delivery, which is, and maybe I'll get some emails and tweets about this, but I think it's a blend of, of art and science. And we're trying to, to cram that theory-laden manufacturing world into a, a hybrid of, of art and science, and it's just not working. Mm-hmm. But even, like I was saying, even with the manifesto, very simple statements, very clear statements, and even those have gotten butchered. So what do you think is the, you know, once we get past the metaphoric thinking, do we move away from sound bites? Do we move to, you know, peer-reviewed journals and, and all these data-driven discussions? Or, or what is that, that next step that creates the language that we need to clearly express these ideas to the greater, wider audience? You know, I wish I had that crystal ball. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Oh, come on, Bill. You got to know the answer. Uh, I'm not a very good futurist. I really am not. I'm really good at looking at, at the here and maybe at the past and uh, the future. Uh, you know, I'm not one of those people who writes a year end. Here's what's going to happen in tech. Uh, it's not my thing. But uh, you know, I, I think what I see around us is I, I think you I think you can find the answer to all of our problems uh, in the Church Turing thesis. Uh, what is computable is what computers can can describe algorithmically. Everything else, you know, whether it is is not right. And you can in different branches of knowledge uh, that, that gets different terms. You know, philosophically, epistemologically, it's it's metaphysical, right? But uh, whatever you want to call it, the part of technology delivery that involves dealing with people and figuring out what their problems are and communicating that to each other in a lossless kind of way is, you know, to go back to computing terms, it's at least NP hard, right? Or, you know, or something along those lines. It's not going to re- key being, it's not going to resolve itself to an algorithm. There's no rule set that's going to teach us how to do technology delivery. And and that's kind of a good thing because we'd all be out of a job because someone would write a program to write all the programs. And so I don't think there's any answer in the sense that someone's going to define the methodology that's going to, you know, ensure success. But I do think our, maybe our, it may be also true that our biggest problem though, is all the superstition and half truths and sales pitches and all the rest of it that gets in the way of people actually learning to do this better. Um, because the people can definitely learn to do it better because, well, I've seen them do it. I feel that I've gotten better at this over the last 15 years, as I'm sure some people who worked with me 10 years ago would tell you if they were to work with me today. And sometimes they do. And, you know, we, we'd work, we, we were better at what we did 10, 15 years ago. So. Well, and I wonder if it comes back to something even simpler and something that you've sparked with your site is just being willing to have the conversations around the, the types of principles and the work that we do. Because I notice, you know, my career is based on pretty much 16 years of Fortune 500 companies and working in the, these large organizations and these large company-type environments. And we don't spend typically a lot of time talking about how we do the work. Mm-hmm. We talk about the work we need to do. And mm-hmm. so I wonder if just getting back to having discussions, you know, trying to carve out a couple hours a week and say, these are the things, these are our practices, these are our systems, do they make sense? And really trying to get, let's take this principle and let's spend an hour just chewing through it. And how does it really apply here? And where have we lost trust? Or where do we not support people? And then start working through that. It gets back to the concept of a retrospective, I think, which Agile installed and tried to bring. But I find, and maybe your experience is different, but I find that talking about how we do the work is not as common as the work we, is, is not as common as talking about the work that we need to do. Yeah, I mean, I think that's probably true. You know, I've been very fortunate over the last six years to be uh, working on the uh, same 
team with the same team. Not every member is the same. Some are. Um, some of them have been there less, but still several years. And uh, so I have to reach a little further back. And in, in, in so I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to reach back, I think, to probably around 2003 or so. I remember having a conversation. Uh, I was still working as a consultant at the time. I've, I had probably even blogged this along the way. I, I, I really got fed up with roles, and I wanted to focus on activities. <laughs> you know, I, yeah. I, remember, I remember I just read Deming's uh, New Economy, and I was really enamored of that book. Um, um, and just to show you how things uh, – rise and fall in favor. I, I remember being excited about it and talking about it on the extreme programming mailing list and getting feedback from people that we didn't want any of that six Sigma like stuff in here. And, and now Deming via the lean stuff has come right into agile to the point where people would probably be surprised, but if it's not what you're used to, people react negatively. And so uh, systems of activities was a thing for me back then. And so I didn't like the idea of having a retrospective um, or a, some, or a the idea of a programmer, but programming and retrospecting were things that you might want to do uh, more frequently even than every week. I mean, if you're not thinking at least a little bit about how th- how the today went and getting feedback from people, well, you're it's like uh, Kent Beck's old metaphor: driving a car by holding the steering wheel really tight and pointing it down the road versus constant <laughs> adjustments. <laughs> I absolutely think that good teams spend time thinking at the meta level about what they're doing or how they're doing what they're doing and not just what they're doing. My current team does not have anything resembling formal practices for this, though, because we've iterated on this so many times that you know now we have a conversation and we all know if somebody's having a hard time with it. And usually it's just, I can tell you're having a hard time with this. Let's talk about why. As a team lead, I feel like that's my my only real main responsibility at this point is to make sure that everyone is okay. Even the people who aren't like me, who like to you know talk endlessly and throw their opinion out, you know, forget baking it. Let's just throw it out out there while it's still raw eggs and some flour and see whether there's anything worth going with. Some people aren't like that. Some people want to think everything through and form their opinion and then share it. And so you have to be sensitive to that. And I think, so I don't think any process fits all, including, hey, we're going to have weekly rec- retrospectives. Well, if that works for your team, that's the right answer. Um, on the other hand, you might want to have someone who's very sensitive to how people think about interacting with others and checking with them on a more frequent basis. I don't, I, it, it, it's so context driven. Um, but I do agree with you that it's probably not done as much as it needs to be because we're always in a hurry, right? We're always got to get it done. We're always got to get it right the first time. Clearly, I'm not in that camp. <laughs> I don't believe that. <laughs> but it's a it's a thought that's been expressed before on the podcast. I think uh, we talked about uh, retrospective frequencies with uh, Woody Zool, mm-hmm. the uh, you know no estimates advocate, uh, mob programming. I think he is one of the founding people of that process, but it seemed, even with him, it seemed like mob programming is just a constant retrospective wrapped around a programming activity. So you have this constant feedback of the whole team working on the, on the software. It's one of those, uh, take an idea and blow it out to the, the ultimate level. I think you're right. The idea that, uh, why wait till the end of a sprint to deal with an issue if you can handle, you know, if you can do a 15-minute t- retrospective on something that just happened and get past it and move on, why not do it on the spot as opposed to uh, following ceremony, structure, uh, those types of things? But it also gets back to, you know, this is empiricism. We're supposed to inspect and adapt and, and act transparently. So it's like you said, if, if more frequent retrospectives are what your team needs, do them. You know, don't be bound by, by the, the chains of some rule in a guide or in a book um, create the environments that provide the support that people need, right? I mean, that's what we're, that's what we're told to do. I think, honestly, I think we had the answer 30 years ago when Jerry Weinberg wrote Secrets of Consulting. Uh, his Rudy's Rutabaga rule is as good as any rule I've ever heard of. If, you, if you're not familiar with it, you should go read it. It's a great anecdote. It's a great book, uh, whether you're a consultant or not. It's a great book about it, about just interacting with other people. But Rudy's rutabaga b- rule, uh, like I said, I'll leave the story why it's named that to, to Jerry to tell. But but the the advice is whatever you know, figure out what your biggest problem is and then solve it. Uh, but when you do that, remember your number two gets a promotion. <laughs> so um, <laughs> 
<laughs> so you're always going to be solved. You always have a biggest problem, no matter what you're doing. Uh, but I believe in that book, Jerry says, people who are effective at solving these kinds of problems or any kind of problem. It's not that they have fewer problems. They have smaller ones. They have lots of little problems instead of a few big ones. Um, and I think that applies to things like well, how do I, how frequently should I retrospect? Um, I think when you phrase it as an activity, by the way, I think it starts to sound kind of silly. How, how often are you retrospecting today? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it sounds kind of silly when you put it that way. Um, you know, but if you, or how often, how often do you care enough to check in with your coworkers to see? how they're doing, how things are going, and, and, and think, yeah, when you start talking about it like that, it is kind of silly to even ask, isn't it? You would right. think you'd want to do it as often as needed. Exactly. And, and maybe, you know, maybe that's, and that, well, not maybe. It will be different for every group of people and every yes. person who's thinking about it. Um, if you're someone who worries a lot about the how people are getting on on the team and that's a you know you you, you could be thinking about this all the time and, and actually it could interfere with your effectiveness right if you're constantly pulling people out of what they're doing to go hey i noticed you hesitated for a few minutes in that meeting are you okay <laughs> right pretty soon they're gonna be like yeah i'm fine and and uh, i think just ultimately the worst thing you can do is create an environment where people don't feel comfortable talking about what how they're right. about problems that is really the only thing you really need and we're back to the 12th principle like if you don't create an environment where people feel comfortable saying yeah i really wasn't okay with it. oh it's one level of dysfunction or maybe we'll flip this over it's one level of funk of effectiveness if they're willing to talk to whoever's quote in charge or anyone who has taken on this this role uh, informally of the person everyone confides in that's that's going to work but it's even better if they can just say you know you and i work together and we're in a meeting and you say something that puts me off and i can just say ryan I, I, I want to check in with you there. I didn't quite that that didn't feel right to me. Are you saying that you didn't like what I did on that? And you can say, or you, and then you feel comfortable with saying, actually, I really didn't. I, I didn't know how to bring it up. I'm glad you mentioned that. Like that's healthy, but that environment takes a lot of commitment and and I think time to build. You can you won't get people that trusting, you know, just by saying, hey, we're going to do agile now or anything else. Um, <laughs> You know. We're going to trust each other now. Everything's safe now. Fire away. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're going to send you to training today, and it's going to make sure that when you're done with training, you guys should all be trusting. So if you're not trusting, I need to know about it or else. That's right. <laughs> and we'll put you on a on an action plan to get you there. Yes, there's a remediation. You'll, you'll, we'll send you to remediation, and uh, the first one won't go in your review, but the second one will. Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> I think it's also <laughs> important, you know, when, when the principal – says give them the environment mm -hmm. uh, and like you said it's very difficult to build but i think there also has to be a commitment to maintenance and and maintaining that environment and almost um cultivating it protecting it shepherding it you know making sure that it actually stays and people like you you know like what you were saying where you see your role really as being that um that person who keeps that environment sound and, and having companies and teams that, that make that commitment also seems just as important as the initial build out of that environment and support structure. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's the case. I, I think one thing to always ask yourself whenever these things come up, people who not every, <laughs> one thing I've learned in the 20 years I've been be doing this for a living is that not everybody thinks about these meta questions or finds them particularly interesting, but wants to go to work as a programmer. Um, so those of us who do have to remind your, ourselves that, uh, so, or at least I feel like I have to remind myself that there, you should always remember who is the, the you or the we or the they that is responsible for these things. Take a step back and say, can it take care of itself? So when I'm, if I'm, tasked with the role of team lead, I feel that's part of my responsibility. But even if I'm not, it's something I will probably try to do at least, at the very least, with my interactions with others. And if I see someone struggling, I have a tendency to step in and go, hey, you feeling okay? You know, because something I can do to help, which is probably why I keep getting stuck as a team lead, which I don't really particularly want to be. Uh, <laughs> I'd rather be a programmer. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I made peace with that a while back. It, um, But yeah, I think you have to Ask yourself, how do you maintain the system? But honestly, I think the system, if it's effective, uh, will maintain itself in the sense that 
we're talking about a complex adaptive system as it's not a game. I, I, I know people have used that metaphor, but there, there's no rules here unless you consider politics rules uh, or a game. And I don't think it is. I, I think a political systems model describes a software effort or a technology delivery effort very well. What you see if you look at political systems theory is that the members, the interactions uh, of such a system are concerned with the value, the authority, authoritative allocation of value of such a system. And it's and if you look at whether you're looking at a political system of five people or a nation, uh, such systems have a tendency to persist. So the question really is, is how do you make sure you don't break it? Right. Especially once you have it, if you've established trust, that's the most valuable thing you've got. Maintaining that is really about just not doing anything to break it. Right. And if the environment is turning toxic, creating that context bubble that protects it and I don't know any rules on how to do that, but you have to be, you have to focus on its existence and you have to care to keep it that way. And then, the, then it becomes politics. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I, and I think you hit on it, just the awareness, you know, just looking around and realizing there are systems in place and that if those get broken or if there are people that come in and become bad actors, that it, it can be broken. I think that's something that not most people think about that. This is something that could be torn down. Uh, yeah, and I think that's why I like the metaphor of a bubble. Uh, by the way, I'm not anti-metaphor. Uh, I, I don't know if we want to go back to that for a second, but <laughs> metaphor has <laughs> metaphors have a valid purpose. Uh, they can be used to teach. They can be used in research if they're deep enough in scientifically uh, structured analogies. Um, but they can be. They're very useful for explaining one concept in terms of another. What I think they're, they're, they stink at is sharing knowledge amongst experts, um, unless right. you're very, very careful. So I wanted to put that out there because I've already been accused of being anti-metaphor in some of the uh, conversations this week, and uh, not with you, but with others. And, and that really isn't what I'm on about. It's just we're misusing it. Um, well, no, but, I was going to highlight your hate of metaphors in the show notes. <laughs> glad you brought that up. Yeah, I'm glad you did. <laughs> uh, no, I... I I, yeah. I think most people get the nuanced point that if you want to convey a, a, a general concept, the metaphor is great. But when you're talking to software professionals and you're trying to take uh, one deep, complex topic, tell a metaphor about it and apply it to another deep, complex topic, a lot's going to get lost in translation. And I think that's really the mm -hmm. driving point there. Well, and there's method that needs to be established there. You know, right. you can use metaphor to reason and analogically, but the goal of that type of reasoning, assuming you have a deep and coherent enough metaphor, if something in the source domain suggests that it might exist in the target domain that you're that you're trying to learn about, that is grounds for that becomes a hypothesis that you need to go test in the target domain. It doesn't. Uh, I, I saw, for example, I saw someone talking about how as willpower declines in the afternoon, people eat more junk food, and I saw that extended to software development. Well, this is why we have bugs in the afternoon uh, because our willpower is dropping. It's like, well, that's an interesting hypothesis, but you can't just start running out there and saying it's a conclusion. You know, we need to if we if we were anything like a, a you know other empirical learning type folk. We would actually say, that's it. let's go find out if that, that relationship holds. So that's how I want to see us use metaphor better, is, is to rein in our tendency to jump to conclusions because you know, we're programmers who do those kind of intuitive leaps, I guess, all the time. And some of us are very, very good at it. Some of the metaphors and how people use them are probably effective for them. Uh, and I'm sure they're effective for them, but they won't necessarily be effective for others. And that's, that's where I think we get hung up, is we, we share this knowledge as if it's knowledge, and really it's just personal experience. I, I'm guilty as charged. I've used metaphor very effectively over the last 20 years to convey my ideas to others. I, I just wouldn't necessarily recommend you try it. <laughs> uh, so, Your you know, mileage may yeah. vary. <laughs> Your mileage may vary. I mean, how many times have we seen YMMV and arguments about Agile over the last 20 years? It's like, well, of course. Uh, of course it will vary. It doesn't stop us from thinking we're right, though. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're all right within our own little bubbles and context. Yes. And it's like you said, when you when you try to jump out of that, all of a sudden that uh, that's where the, the friction uh, takes a hold. It's funny, I, I was looking at uh, our good friend Tim Ottinger's uh, Twitter feed and he had just uh, retweeted, someone was quoting the, the famous metaphor, programming is like building a house. Mm -hmm. and, I saw uh, that. <laughs> and they said, said by a programmer who knows nothing about building a house to another programmer who also knows nothing about building a house. 
And I thought that was just spot on to uh, the metaphor conversation is that we constantly want to pretend that it's software development is like building a house and none of us have typically built a house. So how the hell would we know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what are what are you talking about right now you know <laughs> yeah those, those two programmers don't know anything about building a house and i would say they don't know anything about using metaphor either <laughs> uh, and if they're really talking yeah. like that they really they probably don't understand developing software either yeah that's so. probably uh, well you know maybe it works for them Leo, you know, we always have to say that in the absence in the absence of solid foundations for knowledge sharing i i've gotten in this habit over the years if it works for you, great. Uh, you know, and in right. fact, I abandoned, you know, I, I, I abandoned agile for a long time in the sense that I, I stopped describing myself as an agile practitioner. I don't feel like I've ever stopped doing extreme programming, but I don't know if an XP, uh, person who's read XP explained would look at what I do and think it, you know, there's none of the practices are here. It's like, well, if you look, they're there, but you know, I've gotten it to the point of saying, well, hey, whatever works for you, that's the thing you should be doing, not what somebody wrote in a book somewhere. Um, it's, you know, and, and I think this is the heart of that. Uh, two guys talking about building a house and how that's exactly right, the code they wrote the other day. Oh, well, I don't know. If their customers are happy, I suppose that works, right? <laughs> I think a lot of our current focus is on much more psychological knowledge sharing where we we use a metaphor or uh, an analogous area and we try to map people's experience into that um i think that can work for individuals uh, i think it works great for a direct transmission of you know if i work with you for five years you know we can use a metaphor to talk about that time when we did that thing and you know we got that project out on time that works great but reaching out across time and space to people i think this is this looks this looks very interesting i'd like to look at this uh, in more detail at some point and the really, I think the uh, the key to to the work that Dan's doing is that he's trying to map the things that we do into a a business pattern language, mm -hmm. so that we can sit down with a CEO and have a discussion in their terms and, mm -hmm. and about things that are important to them, but still express you know all of the things that are important to us as well, such as you know building projects around motivated individuals, but saying it in such a way that resonates back to. Uh, the business. Mm -hmm. It's it's an interesting way to go, but it's um, certainly one of many efforts in that area. Well, you know, imagine if if imagine if after you know uh, the, the the working title, by the way, for my metaphor stuff is a bonfire of metaphors, and uh, I want to burn them all. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> but maybe what rises out of the ashes of that is we reclaim some of these metaphors, and, and I think it's only after we've done our due penance and gotten them fully out of our system and replaced them with much better models for, for, for reasoning and sharing knowledge. But where maybe manufacturing comes back someday is in this type of thing, where if you want to talk to the head of a manufacturing facility about the technology delivery efforts in his organization – or in her organization, or in their organization, or whoever you're talking to, <laughs> what 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 you need to do is find a domain that they understand that that they're an expert in that you can map your domain that you're an expert in to them. That's what that's a teaching metaphor, and that's 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 what this looks like to me. This looks like a a, a very coherent, structured uh, collection of of deep metaphors, and I think that has a lot of value. Um, I don't know that it has a lot of value in the other primary way of using metaphor, which is research and expert to expert communication. Um, you know, to pick on my other favorite uh, metaphor this week to pick on tech debt uh, and the two different, very different meanings of that one. Uh, the problem with going around and saying, hey, you have a lot of tech debt, you should, you know, pay down the interest on that. Well, if you're talking to, you know, financial people you're working with bankers that might be a good use of the metaphor which is what ward cunningham was using it for in the first place but if what you're doing is talking to programmers skip that and say hey you you need to refactor here you guys have got so much cruft in the in this code you know you've got there i've you know there's a thousand line method there uh you know time to, time to do some refactoring you don't the metaphor gets in the way if, if they don't understand those terms uh or they don't understand uh, you know, take it to a more technical, you know, for, you know, let's get out of the agile terminology and just simply say, you know, hey, I think you need to uh, consider um, uh, changing out uh, the 
underlying technology of what you're using. Don't use metaphors for that. Go ahead and talk about the underlying technologies. Say you need to replace this with a queue, or maybe you need to introduce uh, um, a, a single-threaded model here because there's some kind of weird uh, race condition here. Don't, don't, don't use tech debt. <laughs> to substitute for all of that uh, technical conversation. It, and if the person you're talking to can't understand that and yet is responsible for the technology delivery, well, I think you have a different problem. <laughs> yeah, and I wonder if a lot of that is just lazy thinking. If we've gotten into this this pattern or this mindset of, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use these metaphors to get out of this conversation or to not dig deep, or, or maybe I don't know. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's, there's, I mean, lots of reasons, right? Lots of reasons. I, I, I think if I was going to generalize them, <laughs> which I like to do, um, th- this touches on something I've been calling the, 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 the pedantic curse, um, or paleo positivist thinking that I see in our, uh, in our industry, we, we have a tendency to, and I don't know if it's because we're programmers and so we think in precise terms, or, uh, I have some other ideas on where this comes from. Um, but uh, we seem to have this belief that if we just define everything just so, we will so- solve this knowledge sharing problem. And so I think some people, at least, they, they have very clear ideas of what they mean by tech debt. And they think in it, and they can use it effectively. Uh, and they're out there with that very precise definition. And so they want to talk to you in that definition. And so you, you can always tell when you're up against the pedantic curse because they'll correct your definition of tech debt, which is a metaphor. And then they'll maybe even go so far as to say, here, read this first, and then we can talk about this. And I, I just think that's kind of, I, you know, the positivists tried this with the science, you know, the logical positivism in the, in the 20s, the Vienna Circle, they tried this and it was roundly shot down and is now discredited in the rest of the sciences. But it seems to be a alive and well and the idea that you know if you just specify everything up front uh and decompose from there um you'll have your correct answers at the end you know it doesn't work well for software and it works even worse when it comes to talking about software <laughs> yeah so let us define our terms and now let's have an argument <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's known as twitter <laughs> <laughs> no we, we do you forgot the hashtag <laughs> oh, right. Well, no, pretty soon it'll be 10,000 lines of that instead. No, here, let me post my dictionary to you, and then we'll argue. Uh, I am killing my account if they go to 10,000. I, I, so. yeah. Oh, I, 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 same here. I, I, I just saw that today. I'm like, well, there goes the last reason I had to use Twitter, which was it was giving me brief updates on what people were thinking. <laughs> The odds of me reading any tweet right now are low. 10,000 character tweets is zero. Yeah. I'll, if I want to read that, I'll read a blog post. Exactly. I mean, you know, and and as someone who's taken the blogging again, they serve very different functions. Twitter is very useful for sharing sound bites. So um, I know we've jumped all over the place, and believe it or not, there's actually source material I have that ties all these things together. I, I thought I'd summarize them real quick for you. There's the idea of this of technology delivery in the widest sense. How do we describe that effectively so we can talk about it? That, and that's the idea of, of technology delivery systems. And I've touched on that, that I, I find a lot of value in the political systems theory for describing what we're doing. There's computer science in there somewhere. And there's, if you saw the Peter Now article floating around this week about uh, programming as a theory building, a 1985 paper uh, that Alistair Coburn had as an appendix in his book in 2006. Uh, As you probably picked up, I I like reading philosophy, and and I had been reading uh, philosophy of science stuff last year, and I came to a similar conclusion, and I had not seen Peter Nauer's paper until uh, yesterday, and I I literally flipped the table when I read it, and actually kind of happy, because it cuts a big chunk of effort out for me. I could just say, like Peter said, (laughs) instead of having to build it up from scratch. (laughs) But I really believe that this so-called delivery system that I'm talking about, all these interactions about value, the value in question is this development of a theory that lives in the minds of everyone involved, not just the programmers, but all of the stakeholders who care about the value. Um, And those computational artifacts that we're delivering (laughs) is the model in the same sense that there are equations that describe real, you know, regular physics theories. Our computational models uh, describe that theory. And all of this lives in this the context of this uh, this environment of uh, of, a, of, a, of this delivery system, 
And the role of metaphor in all of this is is the glue that kind of holds all this together. If we, we can put metaphor back where it belongs, which is in this teaching role and maybe building good, deep scientific metaphors uh, as we model using systems theory, because it's not that technology delivery is a system uh, or, or, a, or a theory building exercise, but it can be modeled as one. Um, so if we want to use the deep metaphor of theory building for, because what technology delivery is ultimately is technology delivery. It's not anything else. It's not like anything else. It is itself. <laughs> so metaphor right. can play a good role there. And ultimately what I feel like all of this leads back to is maybe if we can clear all that smoke out of the way, um, and then things like, well, what is the value of the 12th principle and other ideas like this? You know, all the algebra principles and other principles and good ideas, we can actually start to put them on some sound theoretical basis. Can we investigate trust in an organization? What do the trust relationships look like in an org? And do they matter for how the teams are are, are, um, uh, are, are – does it matter? Can we maybe finally define success in some intersubjective way instead of you'll know it when you see it or your people are happy? Um, I'd love to have a better definition of success that we could compare our efforts with. Um, all of these things tie together in my mind with uh, with just at the end of the day and with, with none of that available, what, we're, what we all fall back on is just following intuition and being open-minded. So that's what it always comes back to for me until someone solves this other problem. <laughs> well, and I think those are, those are some great words to wrap up on. And so, uh, Bill, I'm very happy that Tim brought us together. I I really love these topics, you know, the the use of metaphor and the twelfth principle. I love the idea that people champion a principle. They they spark conversations about uh, digging deeper. So I really appreciate that you created this conversation. You've created this site because it is a it's an important principle. There's a thousand questions behind it that every organization has to ask themselves uh, on how they're going to apply. And not only just bring that principle into their org, but how they're going to live up to it. Uh, so it's a really important conversation that I really appreciate uh, you sparking and, and, and championing. Well, I, I thank you for that. It's great to find people who are interested. I mean, that's why I started this. And in in fact, where this I see this as just the beginning. Uh, I've started another initiative, a larger initiative called uh, called Agnomia, uh, which is uh, uh, which I hope to have that site up. Sometime in the next week, uh, I should have made it a criteria of doing this recording, and I probably would have got it done too. Um, <laughs> but uh, I am—I uh, I still I work in the in the financial industry, and I have no plans on leaving. But um, I wanted an actual entity to start to explore these things and to work with others to explore these things. And uh, so, this whole topic that we've been talking about—the twelfth principle—is just one uh, pillar of that, if you will. And I, I hope to create this what i really my vision of this is almost like a research institute i want to bring people together to to try to answer some of these questions and start to build a good foundation uh it's just an enormous undertaking and, and there's a lot of people that have more knowledge about these topics than i do and i want to go out and find them and bring them all together and you know i i hope that 12 principle.org in, in a year has you know a whole train of articles where people are doing actual research into how trust affects success you know, maybe we'll find out that the whole principle is bs and it has nothing to do with success that would be fantastic if we had that knowledge because right now we don't even have that much right so that's what i'm hoping to do and, and agnomia.com should go live here soon and when it does uh that's where i'll tie everything together <laughs> Well, we'll be sure to get a link in the show notes, and hopefully uh, a few months down the line, maybe we can check back in with you and see yeah. how things are going. That would be fantastic. Well, at this point of the of the show, we allow the guests to uh, plug anything that they have going on. Guess I just uh, did that. <laughs> right. <laughs> so you jumped the gun on that. Sorry. No, 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 no. no. You're fine. Uh, plug anything that they have going on, any other sites, any other... Uh, things on their mind, any book recommendations, anything that they'd like uh, to get in front of the audience before we call it a night. Okay, um, you know, there's there's so much background material to all of this. Um, for metaphor, I think the best book to check out is the uh, um, um, the, the Lake Off book on uh, conceptual metaphor. Uh, the you know, after I turned 40, I lost the ability to remember anything. It's kind of frustrating. <laughs> Things I talk about an hour earlier, I cannot remember. Hold on. Let me get you a title. No, it's funny. Ever since uh, we had kids, 
Uh, yeah. I've, I've told my wife a few times, <laughs> I just can't remember anything. I know Nothing. where their, their soccer ball is. I know, um, I know those things. But if you ask me a book title or, or something that we talked about 10 minutes ago, it's just escaped my brain. I always thought it was funny how my grandmother used to go down the list of all her grandchildren and pets before she called my name. Now I start to get it. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So the book in question is Metaphors We Live By by George Lakoff. It's a classic in the linguistic uh, theory area. Um, But separating literary metaphor from conceptual metaphor, I think, starts there. For anyone who's interested in this topic, that book, I think, is a must read. Um, a lot of the information is rolled up in academia, unfortunately, which makes, you know, behind all the paywalls, some of the really interesting articles that are cited are, are, are hard to get at. Um, uh, but one that's floating around, um, the shift from metaphor to analogy in Western science, like those two places, those are the two places to start with, with metaphor in my mind. And and that's what I plan to build my whole thing around as when I finally get around to writing it all down. Uh, Deidre Gettner and Michael Jezorski. Jez- the shift from metaphor to analogy in Western science. You know, the whole philosophy of science talks about the theory and intersubjectivity and knowledge and all of that. And uh, David Easton's uh, political uh, political science systems work from the 60s is, is also a great source material. Um, I think I already plugged Agnomia, uh, 12thprinciple.org. We've talked about all day. And, uh, you know, you can find me on Twitter as Logosity and Logosity.net's where I've been blogging notes these days. I think that's a good start for uh, everyone to look into. We'll be sure to get all of those items uh, linked into the show notes so that you can uh, all take a look into those materials. And the next time we're talking to Bill, perhaps we'll, uh, we'll get some listener questions about these very deep topics. I mean, these are not trivial discussions and trivial, uh, ideas to dig into. They're really, there's a lot of deep, uh, research and thinking behind them. Certainly not easy topics. No, I mean, they're, I find them fascinating. Uh, ultimately they may lead us nowhere. Uh, but I feel like if you, you, uh, 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 I'll leave you with a great quote that I think sums it all up. Um, it's from, uh, uh, Karl Popper, a uh, philosopher uh, from the early part of the 20th century, he says, uh, nevertheless, there are still some who do believe that philosophy can compose, compose genuine problems about things, and if by chance they find themselves unable to accept any of the existing creeds, all they can do is to begin afresh from the beginning. Uh, I, I like going back to the beginning. I like to start projects with the assumption that nothing is is set in stone uh, and solve for my processes. Uh, it's surprising how fast you can get to a good process that way versus chipping away at all the preconceived notions. And sometimes <laughs> I think it's a good way uh, to figure out what the heck we're doing, uh, even if ultimately we're left with saying, yeah, we don't know what we're doing. Well, that, that sound, that's useful too. <laughs> totally agree. Well, thank you, Bill. Really appreciate it. Uh, same here. I love being on the show. This was great. Uh, and I, I really like what you're doing here. This is a really, uh, really cool, uh, a really cool thing that you've got going on. And I'm your host, Ryan Ripley. No plugs this week. I do want to actually, I will plug one thing. So Bill brought up extreme programming explained my all time favorite book. Uh, I think it's, uh, if, if we would have stopped there in the agile movement, <laughs> we would be, uh, it, that would have been enough. I think Kent Beck gave us, uh, a, a real gem of a novel. And uh, if you guys have not read that, I think it's a must read. If you're listening to this podcast, I believe that uh, there's a high likelihood that you'll love that book. So that'll be my my plug for the week. Otherwise, 2016 is setting up to be a great year for the podcast. We're getting some really fun guests lined up along with some of the uh, the old favorites that uh, that people have really enjoyed hearing. So Again, I can't thank everyone enough. 2015 was a great year for the podcast. We've gone back and looked at some of the numbers, some of the the downloads, the shares, all the things that uh, all of you are doing to spread the word and to get the uh, the listenership uh, moving in the right direction. And just cannot say enough times how grateful we are uh, for all of you listening to the podcast, for being there, and for sharing your ideas and the and the podcast. So thank you again. And we're looking forward to a great 2016. And with that said, Bill, thank you again for joining me. And everyone, have a great night. Thanks for listening to Agile for Humans. Let's keep the conversation going. Drop us a question on Twitter at Agile for Humans or visit agileforhumans.com.